We know you're here, and we'll find you. It's no secret that Arcane Studios have been inspired by Looking Glass in their work. Dishonored's player fantasy bears a striking resemblance to that of Thief. While Prey draws clear inspiration from the System Shock franchise, Arcane even did an homage to the forefathers of the immersive sim genre by naming one of Prey's technology after them. Welcome to another episode of the Game Dev Pantry, a channel that focuses on retro engineering mechanics or system in Unreal Engine. Don't forget that you can always grab the project by following the link in the description. Since genre discourse is one of the biggest challenges of video game research, we will instead offer a simple definition for the immersive simulation genre to clarify our analysis. The immersive sim genre is defined by its approach based around player expression. Games of this genre will have a very open nature, meaning that a single encounter or puzzle can be solved by a number of ways, often through emergent gameplay. Good afternoon, Talos. Security reminder. Sticky notes, even well hidden ones, are not a secure need. What allows for this type of gameplay is systemic design. Systemic games have a lot of systems that interact with one another in various ways and tend to give the player an arsenal of tools to interact with those in different ways. If these tools can interact with systems from multiple angles of gameplay, it's even better. Let's take Prey for example. Welcome to deep storage. The glue cannon allows the player to freeze enemies in place. But it can also help him reach high places extinguish fires, or stop electric blasts from broken generators, and much more. All of these different actions represent an input that the player can make into the game's system. But the glue cannon doesn't only fire input into the game's systems, it can receive them as well. Other systems may input directly into the glue cannon. The biggest example of that would be the ammunition system, which is part of the resource system. Without ammunition, you can't fire the glue cannon. However, ammunition can be found or crafted using materials, which can be acquired in various ways, including recycling the glue. The resource system either receives inputs or outputs something in almost every other system in the game, making it core to the experience of playing Prey. Prey's resource system can be defined as the system that contains everything that can be stored in the inventory as well as what interactions the player has with those. It contains everything from health packs to neuromods, from guns to crafting materials, Basically, everything in the game is a resource, making Prey an immersive sim about resource management. The main reason for that is that the resources are scarce, meaning that the player will have to be as resourceful as possible to get by. It encourages the player to be creative with every encounter and to always try new things in order to use as little resources as possible. The player will have to understand its enemy's weaknesses and use every bit of emergence to its advantage. Having barely no resources also encourages the player to search for every nook and cranny, making exploration incredibly rewarding. To balance the draught of resources, the developers gave the players the ability to recycle almost anything to create useful things in return. Recycling in Prey is the act of transforming objects into material pieces. This is a wonderful piece of design since it feeds directly into the core fantasy of the immersive sim genre, player choice. A player could choose to recycle junk into ammunition to blast their way through, while another could use it to build neuromods, choosing to learn new alien powers. 
There are two possible ways to create crafting materials in Prey. Using the Recycler or the Recycler Charge. This video will focus on the latter because of its wide range of uses. The Recycling Charge, not unlike the Glue Cannon, possesses many use. For starters, it's the most lethal weapon in the game. The grenade can recycle enemies, dealing massive damage to them, and even works against multiple enemies at a time. It can be used to destroy obstacles and discover new spaces, allowing the player to skip specific requirements for exploration. Finally, it can be used to create crafting materials from almost every element in the environment, including, but not limited to, fellow survivors. Every recyclable object in the game is attributed a material value, defining its yield when recycled. There are four categories of material yield. Mineral, organic, synthetic, and exotic. We did some tests to figure out exactly how these values were attributed. Our first hypothesis was that each object would be tagged with one or more component types, and that the values would be determined by the mass factor. The bigger the object, the more material it would yield, basically. However, we rapidly pushed aside this hypothesis, as smaller objects would sometimes yield big values, while similar sized objects would yield very different values from one another. So what we think the developers actually did is that they assigned an array of material types and values to each object in the game manually. This way, they could perfectly author and balance object placement and values, making the level design much more complex. While placing junk in another game might seem mundane or simply visual, in Prey, it becomes a balancing puzzle. To build the basis of this system, we created a struct containing two pieces of key information, material type and yield value. Using an array of the struct, we are able to tag any objects with the ability to yield material. These objects are all children of a master prop blueprint that will contain all the logic for the recycling mechanic. The children will only differ in that they will possess a different recycling identity and a specific static mesh. Once we've set up our items, we will jump to the charge throwing mechanic. As we've stated before, the recycling charge in Prey acts as a grenade. It can be thrown to different distances based on how long you hold down the throw button, and once it's thrown, it ticks for a small amount of time and then creates a vacuum effect, affecting every object in its massive range. We started by programming the throwing part. When the button is pressed, it starts a timer which slowly fills a progress bar that we added to the player HUD. When the button is released, we apply a force to the grenade that is relative to the time we held the button. When launched, the grenade starts ticking a timer that produces light and sound until it explodes. When the grenade explodes, it creates a stunning visual effect and starts attracting all objects in a big radius. For the attract function, we use the single interface call in props that constantly adds force. Interfaces are a great way to call functions in specific actors of different classes without having to define their class beforehand, therefore reducing memory cost. Actors that implement this interface will fire the specific function, while other actors that do not will simply ignore it. For the visual effect, however, we needed to create a complex material shader. As you can see, the visual effect in Prey stretches every pixel contained in a sphere-like shape. At first, it stretches them inwards, towards the center of the sphere, until the vacuum effect is over. Then, when the effect reaches its end, it stretches pixels outwards and inwards in alteration, creating a ripple-like effect. We created a similar material to reproduce this visual effect.
In summary, the material first divides the screen in quadrants relative to the object's center. Then, it defines a specific area to affect. In our case, it'll be a sphere. Then, it stretches all pixels relative to the center of the sphere. This effect will be controlled by a float, which allows us to stretch back and forth. Finally, the material will be applied to a sphere that we will scale along with a timeline. However, a sphere turned to be problematic because if we wanted it to affect a large area, it meant that the player could easily go inside the sphere and negate the visual effect. This interaction, however, proved to be present in Prey as well, but at a much closer range. To reproduce this, we made the sphere a lot thinner and made sure it was always facing the player. Finally, we wanted the sphere to be rendered on top of everything so that it affects things between it and the player. To do so, we simply disabled the depth tests in the material. Now that the material is done, we can manipulate it with the timeline to modulate the intensity of the stretching effect. In the same timeline, we created an event to fire when the charge releases its second explosion after the vacuum effect. This event will trigger a sphere trace around the charge that will take the information from every prop in the vicinity and save it in an array. The sphere trace will be considerably smaller than the initial explosion, as we only want to recycle items that are near the charge. Then, we will go through the array of props and find the material yields information, which will be saved for later use. Once we have all the information we need, we will delete the props that were recycled and start the next step of our recycling, the creation of the material yields. In Prey, once the explosion is finished, material pieces are ejected, resulting in a material shower. We reproduce this with our array of material yields. Using this array, we will start queuing material pieces that will be projected at the moment of the second explosion. To do this, we created the function that uses a counter to spawn materials with a time interval. The function spawns the material ball and then checks if it does not exceed the last index of the material yields array. If it doesn't, it fires the same function in an allocated time. This results in material pieces being spawned for each element of the array, but with a delay between each instantiation. The materials are spawned, but we need a way to collect them and to add them to some form of data structure. In Prey, of course, there is a whole inventory system with its own quirks and perks. Each item can have a different size, and the inventory size can be changed over the course of the game. This type of inventory management fits perfectly with the core of the game, which, as we established earlier, is centered around resource management. However, the inventory alone would be enough content to produce a video on, and we might at some point, but for now we'll simplify the inventory concept by a lot. What we will do instead is a simple text that shows us what we collected. To do so, we will have an array of the struct we created earlier that will have the name Inventory. After that, we will build a widget blueprint that will update with information about our inventory. We will show the type of material as well as the value. The widget will also be added to the HUD and we will create an input to allow the player to toggle its visibility. The only thing missing to the project is a way to pick up those materials. As you can see, in Prey there is a prompt that pops up every time the player detects an object. This prompt indicates the item name and its quantity. We implemented a sphere trace to detect objects near the player using the camera forward vector as the look direction. We needed a simple way to retrieve information from hit objects, and we decided to use an interface to do so. The interface is fired on every object hit by the sphere trace and returns a valid boolean. 
If the object is valid, then the prompt appears retrieving the item information at the same time. The prompt widget blueprint is modified to appear if there is a valid object, and to change its text as well. Finally, this function will also create a reference for that object, so that we can collect it. We set up a collect input that checks if there is a valid object to collect, and then collects it, adding it to our inventory. Here we go. We can now fire a grenade to recycle stuff, and then collect the materials, and keep them in our inventory. We put a few meshes in our scene to create a small sci-fi room. Those meshes come from a free environment pack that we found on the Unreal Marketplace, which you can find following the link in the description. With sound added and everything, it looks a bit like this. Thank you again so much for joining us for this episode of the Game Dev Pantry. We hope you liked this video. If you want to support us, consider giving us a like, subscribing, or sharing our content. We'd also like to take our time to thank our Patreon, as this is the very first video that they supported. If you want to join them in supporting us, you can go to our Patreon and join our very cozy and friendly Discord while you're at it. Until next time, and have a good one.